And he joins me right now, and I can't stress this enough, the absolute legendary Mr. Bob Gale is on the phone right now. Bob, how are you doing? I'm doing just fine, Brad. Thanks for having me having me on this call. Yeah, no, I'm, you know, I'll be honest with you. I'm being 100% transparent. I don't know if I've ever been starstruck before in an interview, but I am 100% geeking out a little bit talking to you today. <laughs> All right, well, we'll... Uh, I can't tell, so uh, you're, <laughs> you're covering it up very nicely. Okay. Well, we're here to talk about the 35th anniversary release of the Back to the Future trilogy now on 4K, which is incredible. Um, my copy comes in the mail today, so I'm excited to get home to watch it. But how great do these movies look in 4K now? Oh, it's absolutely amazing. They, they look better than they ever looked in the theater. It's the what's, what's actually... What they can actually capture from the original film negative uh, that just kind of goes away every time you make a film print. Uh, and then when you go back to the, to the original source, um, there are things in there that, uh, that I'd never seen before. In fact, when we were doing the remaster, um, there was, uh, uh, we could actually see a member of the crew uh, standing off to the side in the buckboard, runaway buckboard scene in part three. Um, so we actually had to blur that out a little bit. <laughs> so it's so clear you're finding things that we've never seen before. And that was really... That you're not supposed awesome. to see, yeah. That you're not supposed to even see. And that was what was awesome about even the Blu-ray releases is I started looking in the window and blast from the past and I'm seeing like a Dragnet poster with Tom Hanks that I'd never seen before. So now I'm excited to see what I can find that I haven't seen before. And every time y'all do one of these releases, you find a way for us fans to enjoy them all over again. Like, this time you're putting alternate... The alternate future, I believe, is the, what the extras call, where you're showing auditions from people who may have been Marty and Doc. Is that right? Uh, well, not Doc, uh, but uh, Marty and uh, Marty and Jennifer and Biff, yeah. And one of those one of those that's been making the rounds online is Ben Stiller. So who were some, who were some of the people who came in who you thought... Because I know originally it was Eric Stoltz, then we went Michael J. Fox, who knocked it out of the park, but was there anybody in those alternate timelines that you thought really could have had a great grasp at the role, looking back at it now? We, we were very seriously considering uh, C. Thomas Howell to play Marty. Um, so, so that was, uh, he was, he was very high up on the list. And, um, but, but no, in terms of, of, of who you're going to see on these, on these, um, on these snippets of, of casting, and, and they are snippets. Don't I want anybody to think that they're going to get to see you know uh, Ben Stiller do a two minute two minute scene. It's more like you know thirty or forty seconds of, of a scene. Uh, we just want to give you the flavor of, of all these folks. Um, and uh, and again, my uh, thanks to to everybody who agreed to uh, allow their auditions to be on this disc there because there were some people that said, "No, nah, I don't want. I really don't want people to see that." Um, <clears throat> so you'll see, you'll, you'll see these people and you'll say, well, uh, gee, I think, I think those guys uh, made the right choice to, to hire who they hired. <laughs> well, I'm excited to see them. And one of the things that was really great about the DVDs when they first started coming out and y'all put the deleted scenes on and the fan community was abuzz by all these deleted scenes. But the one that I've always wanted to ask you about was, uh, back to the future part two, uh, they're in 2015, they're in Hilldale, Old Man Biff comes back, he's in disarray, and then he eventually disappears. Now, the disappearing part was cut from the film, which um, when I saw that, my mind was really blown by the fact that he disappeared, and now all of a sudden I'm trying to put it together, and Stephen Clark on BackToTheFuture.com tells me, you know, Lorraine shot him in the 90s or something like that, but why was the scene uh, originally cut? Do you remember why y'all decided to take Oh, sure, absolutely. No, that was the idea. The idea was that the yeah, old Biff had had warped the past in, in such a uh, manner that he returned to a future in which he didn't he didn't himself exist, and so that's why we had him being erased from existence. But we we previewed the movie with that in there, and the audience was very very confused, and there really was no way they they could ever put that together uh, until they saw the movie a second or a third time. So. Bob Zemeckis and I just decided, you know what, let's just have him look like he's having a heart attack or a stroke or something from the, 
you know, from the stress of time travel and leave it at that and, and let, we'll let bygones be bygones because we didn't want people to be confused about it. Yeah, you know, and I guess that had I not seen the movie umpteenth amount of times, I probably would have put it together when I first saw it either. But I think that looking back at it, what it tells us about the perils of time travel, it really is everything that Doc warned us about, right? That you can go back and what you do in the past will alter your, your ultimate destiny. And I thought it was such a great moment that now that we get to see you on these releases, which is just so cool to me um, to see. And um, tell people uh, other things that they might get on this bonus uh, disc from the 4K release that they haven't seen prior. Well, there is uh, currently at the Hollywood Museum here in Los Angeles a Back to the Future exhibit of, uh, of props of some of the cars, uh, costumes, uh, artwork, uh, memorabilia. Uh, of course, uh, with COVID, the, the museum is closed, so you can't actually go in and see it right now. But we got in there to do, I, I give a, a little 10 minute tour of, of the exhibit. So for everybody who can't go, which is everybody, uh, you can see that we have about 30 minutes of behind the scenes, uh, and information about back to the future, the musical, which opened in Manchester, England, uh, in February. And then of course we had to close it in March when the government said, uh, they will close in all the theaters. And that, that we expect will be resurrected in London in May. So um, you can get an idea of what that's all about. And i got to tell you, it's a fabulous, fabulous show. I was involved with through the whole thing. Uh, and then there's this, this wonderful, uh, this wonderful uh, piece called Could You Survive Back to the Future, which just kind of pokes at all the, all the laws of physics that we violated. You know, it asks, well, how much pressure would a speaker actually have to have to blow somebody across Doc's lab? Uh, <laughs> what would that be like? And the answer is, well, it would probably, <laughs> probably kill any normal human being. <laughs> oh, my God. I love that. What a great idea for the behind the scenes or for the bonus disc to think about the physics of Back to the Future. I remember seeing something on the History Channel a few years ago about the, the science behind Batman, and that's what that kind of reminds me of. Of, of, of the physics of Back to the Future. That's phenomenal. Out of, um, out of all the things that y'all did, and really in parts two and three, you see the interconnectivity between those two films with little Easter eggs in part two that make allusions to part three. But all three of them have great Easter eggs. What would you say would be your favorite one that you were real proud of, something that you snuck in that people are now still discovering years later? Well, <clears throat> most people have discovered just about everything by now, uh, they've had 35 years after all. <laughs> uh, but there, there is one that, that I love that most people are never thinking about. They don't look at it. And that is, in the first movie, when we, have, we set up the clock tower, save the clock tower, and you look back at the ledge under the clock, the ledge is, is completely whole. And then when Marty comes back at the end of, of the first movie and he's there on the town square, if you look back at the ledge, it's broken from where Doc had stumbled and broke the ledge. Um, yeah. It's not where anybody's looking, but that's in there, and uh, uh, that's a really cool thing. That's a great one. You know, the one that stuck out to me recently that I, I mean, I'm talking three, four weeks ago when I was rewatching the films that I never caught before was in the um, 2015 Hill Valley, the, the logo for the Hill Valley Clock Tower Mall is the clock with the lightning bolt going through it. And I don't know how I'd never noticed that. And I thought, what a great little Easter egg. Yep. Uh, yeah, absolutely. They're, they're all, and, they're and, all and in In there. fact, my wife had clocks made for uh, members of the cast and crew uh, with that image. Uh, as, as the clock, so <laughs> used it again. <laughs> oh, man, that's awesome. Now, I know, obviously, everyone asks it all the time, so I, I'm not going to ask, is there going to be a Back to the Future 4? Because you, you've been pretty clear on, on your answer in that, and, and I think the fan community respects it fully. But when writing Paradox, which was the script for Part 2 and Part 3, I know there was this flirtation with going to the 60s, and if you ever did 
you know, do another installment? Or when you were working on the, the prior three, did you ever have thoughts of a time period that y'all would want to go to that you never got to? Absolutely. We did. We, we thought about uh, the gangster era, the Roaring Twenties, Prohibition. And, in fact, um, if you get your hands on the Telltale Back to the Future game, uh, which is a computer game and also on, uh, I forget whether it's PS, PlayStation 2 or 3 or one, and one of the Xbox consoles. Um, that is the time period where much of the story takes place and it utilized some ideas that Zemeckis and I were kicking around uh, to do in the sequel. So you can see, um, it's, and it's also, by the way, um, uh, in the IDW comic book series, uh, there is a special, uh, a special graphic novel, uh, that, that was a five part mini series, uh, and, um, you can, you can experience it that way. Yeah, the games were great, especially for us longtime fans. They're almost, you know, sequels in their own rights. Uh, and the comic series, the, the Biff to the Future comic series is great. So definitely go get all those IDW releases. Um, I just heard you say, Something I read in an article that maybe it was yesterday or the day before. We all knew about the, or a lot of us longtime fans knew about the alternate ending that involved the refrigerator. But I had never heard about this alternate beginning because I think the, the opening shot of Back to the Future, I would make the argument that it's top five most iconic opening scenes in cinematic history. Uh, and it's the, the, the panning of the clocks. The almost completely one shot. What was the original idea for that open that y'all scrapped? Or, or well, the original that? opening. You see, the, the, as, as you say, the end, the end of the movie, uh, when when the time machine was a refrigerator, and even even the first round when it was a DeLorean, um, they literally had to take the time machine to a nuclear test site um, <laughs> uh, and harness the actual the actual nuclear energy released by an A bomb test. So that was the that was of course uh, utilized by uh, Mr. Spielberg in Indiana Jones Four: Nuke the Fridge, right? Um, so the opening of, the, of Back to the Future was a scene in a classroom where the class was watching a documentary about these nuclear tests, so that everybody in the audience would be educated about what went on at at these nuclear tests in, in Nevada back in the fifties. And so when we changed when we changed that out, uh, it was too expensive for us to do, um, and we were trying to figure out how we're going to save some more money in the in the movie. Um, Bob and I realized we didn't need to have a scene setting up a nuclear test site because we don't have a nuclear tests anymore, and we already had built this wonderful set of Doc's lab. So let's do a little homage to one of our favorite time travel movies, the George Pal Time Machine. Uh, and start with this great opening, long uh, tracking shot over all these clocks and how much you learn about Doc Brown Hill Valley just in those opening two and a half minutes. Yeah, that's, I, I love hearing stuff like that. I just love knowing what the thought process and then And then having to cut something gives you this iconic shot that everybody and their mother knows about. And uh, that's another great scene to look back and see all the little Easter eggs, even with the Harold Lloyd and safety last illusion that we see later on in the film. Such great. I could go on and on and on, but I, I have one more minute with you, so I'm just going to ask you, ask you this, um, and I want to tell you, and I, and I mean this with all sincerity, Mr. Gale, these movies have meant so much to me and so many people. Um, I, I've been with this franchise for as long as I've been alive, and i found new ways every single year to either show it to someone new or to make a new connection to it, whether that was when my grandmother got diagnosed with Parkinson's. Um, again, I just became even more entrenched and in, in connected to this series. Why do you think Back to the Future has lasted these 35 years, and, and why will it continue to last for generations to come, in your opinion? Uh, to me, I think the, the power of Back to the Future is the humanity of it. You know, people talk about, oh, the car is cool and the special effects and all the bells and whistles. But at the heart of it, is the idea that every human being realizes when they're, I don't know, 8, 9, 10 years old, when they come to the realization, oh my goodness, my parents once were children. I mean, that's, that's an incredibly powerful idea, uh, realization that, that every human being makes. And then, you know, once you learn about sex and you say, 
oh my God, my parents did that. Um, <laughs> and you ask yourself, what did my parents do on their first date? Another question that everybody has asked. And so Back to the Future taps into all of those great human uh, human elements that we all have. Plus, it it reminds us that we do have some control over our own destiny. That the decisions that we make when we're young uh, can change the course of our lives. And we see that played out uh, as George McFly, um, you know, learns to stand up for himself and stand up for uh, Lorraine, and uh, he makes a better life for himself just because he's brave enough to do the right thing. I think that that was beautifully said. Mr. Bob Gale, the co-creator of Back to the Future. Of course, you can get the 4K release on your favorite retailer right now. I got mine from Amazon. Find it at the local store near you. Mr. Gale, I 100,000% appreciate you sparing some time for me and talking with me today. I really, truly appreciate it. Oh, you're very welcome, Brad. Uh, 1.21 giga thanks to you. <laughs> <laughs> that is the legendary Bob Gale. Bob, thank you again. <laughs>